Hear that? Believe it or not, summer is just around the corner. Luckily, Armor All, America's most trusted auto appearance brand, has what your car needs to get that perfect summer shine. Plus, now through May 31st, we'll give you $5 for every $20 you spend on Armor All products. That means car wash pods, protectant, tire shine, you name it. Find out how to get your $5 rebate at ArmorAll.com. Armor All, less work, more clean. Terms apply. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my special guest is Mark Weir. Mark is a legend in the mountain bike world, having won the Downeyville Downhill eight times and making his mark at WTB as a demanding product tester over two decades. He even has a mountain bike tire named after him, the Weir Wolf. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Oh, thanks for having me. So you're known as a really accomplished downhill endurance mountain biker. How's that different from the more traditional like UCI style downhill mountain bike race format? For me, when I started, it was definitely, uh, I, I really like to get outside. I really like to see new things. And when I was started racing downhill world cup, uh, I even did some, some cross country UCI events but it th- those guys were so focused and so like built on you know the hamster cage that I couldn't really be involved in as much because a I probably didn't have the talent b I didn't have the ability to sit there and do the same thing over and over again it kind of drove me crazy so with endurance and adventure you know I I could do new things I could on site stuff I could see new places that's kind of what I w- was really into doing. And, and I loved to suffer back then. So I wasn't really ever at my top form. I was always kind of a little bit tired, but I, I o- always thought I could ride through it, but results would show otherwise. <laughs> so enduro mountain bike racing is obviously a hot format right now. How does that connect with sort of the ethos that was established in those early days of, of sort of downhill racing and mountain biking in general? I mean, it, it was kind of, it's funny because we have a, a story back in probably 2002 with Curtis Keene, who was on our team at the time. And even back when, you know, Sam Hill and Wacker and Justin Havacano, like all these Australians came to stay with me. It was uh, interesting because I would do these huge rides and these guys weren't used to that. They were super fast downhill racers. Yeah. And I would take them on these drag out rides and we'd bring like, one soda pop and we'd go do like 8k of climbing and they were just i would just drag them around and you know like curtis was one of my buddies and we would just go do these loops and he never really done that stuff before and he's just like this is really cool but this is 2002 2001 and we even had it like sam hill when he first came here we built up his first enduro bike from intense he didn't have any of the parts staying with me for two weeks well, if we build up this bike, you have to ride with me every day. And I would do this five, seven K day before I go to work and he'd come with me. And, uh, it was one of those things. It's just as eye opening to see how much ground you can actually cover when you turn yourself into a motor and just like cover ground and not just be, you know, ready for a half an hour race or a four minute race or a, you know, hour and a half cross country race. And you turn it into adventure and just that you're always on power your motor always makes power for a long time and you get to see so much new stuff that it's eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. So you were one of the first American athletes to travel to France to race enduro. So how and when did riders like yourself bring sort of that new format to the U S I mean, it was difficult. It's like everything that's ever kind of happened, you know, like I, in the beginning, I had a single ring. I rode a World Force. It was a VP before Santa Cruz could even, you know, you know, shit out the thought, you know. And World Force was also a Zonic before that, and it came from Outland. And I had this bike built up with a single ring, Mr. Dirt Guide, the the, the, the Z1. And we'd, we'd do these rides, and that was kind of like, this bike works good. It sucks going uphill. But we, we could go places down that we could never go before. So in that beginning of all that was like, you know, people didn't really understand it. And so when I started, like the gravity dropper, you know, everyone had the height right. You know, I tried that. And I put on the, the gravity dropper that Wayne sent me, Sniz from uh, 
gravity dropper. He's like, I got this thing. It was during the, the million feet thing. He's like, what are you doing on that VP free? You're doing it. I did it half the year with my seat down. I just stood up everywhere. And I would tell every, I just told everyone, Hey, where you're sitting, I'm standing. And I stood everything, you know, and he's all try this seat post. And they're like, it's ugly. Oh, that's never going to work. And heavy too. I mean, was that a concern? Uh, weight was never a concern because I had horsepower and I didn't care because I wanted in Marin, you know, sometimes you have to get away from the man, you know, cause we live in this police state. So with your chain dropping off, no chain guide, you're out like a three ring circus. Wasn't going to work. That thing's just going to get crammed in. And then, you know, without your seat and your ass and you're on a travel bike, like a VP free, like I was on, you can't ride that thing with a high seat. I got short legs, dude. I'm like, you know, 29 inch inseam with freaking huge body, top body. And so I did that and people are like, yeah. And then it started to work out. People are like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then, so I started, Fred Glow came over when I won like the third Downeyville downhill. I don't really know the date. And, uh, Fred Glow is like one of the originals. He was like the guy that, you know, he was back in them. It was FMF. They're part of that tribe sports group. And Fred owns it, of course. And I took him on this ride. He had two days and we did these huge rides in Downeyville. And he's like, you have to come to my event. And I'm like, okay. And, and Gary and, you know, at WTV is like, you got to go You're in good form. And it, that was probably like 2005 or something and went there, but I was really fit. I was racing road races. I did like the Tam Hill climb, one of the oldest hill climbs in, in Marin, like 50 years old. And only five of us have gone under 40 minutes, you know, and that year I did, you know, and I was like fast uphill and there's, you know, get like net over and those guys never went under 40 minutes and i i was able to do it at 158 pounds i'm 190 now and uh go over there race the first enduro no one even speaks english they're not even getting instructions in english you're gonna do like i think it's three runs on saturday and three three different courses three runs each time no practice and the the tracks are long they're like yeah you can go walk the track if you want but good luck each one's going to take 30 to 40 minutes. So I'm like, okay, let's on site. And, and did, I couldn't, I went to Valoir, one of my favorite venues for that tribe sports group enduro. Cause it's super pure top mountain stuff, wide open fields, pegged, you know, really wide, go where you want, but be aware rocks in the tall grass Yeah. and doing all that stuff. I was like, Oh my God, dude, this is like nothing I've ever seen. You know, you can go where you want. And by the third run, the track starts getting a hot line in it. Uh-huh. You're just going faster every time. And then the other run goes all the way down for that Sunday, you do two more courses that are long. And some of them, one of them was 9,000 feet of descent down and they ended with an old Roman way, mail way. And it was like the brake burner, you know? And I, I was, after Saturday, I was running second and then I, I won one or I got second in the next, uh, the long downhill. So I was running good. And then I ended up just tomahawking cause I just ran out of talent and on site through the goat trails are tough, dude. <laughs> yeah. All those goat trails and you're kind of jumping them straight and right. I fell in one, you know, broke my bike, broke my derailleur, my oh, rear wheel wow. race was over. But when I came home, I'm like, you guys don't understand it. There's this other kind of racing that isn't hamster style. Mm -hmm. You get to see all this terrain and see all this, you know, amazing culture. Mm -hmm. And you're not worried about getting there on Tuesday. You're like, I show up on Friday night or even Saturday morning and I'm in the game. Like no one has the benefit. I didn't like practice. I don't like when you can practice. I think you should practice like wherever you are and, and ride and create situations where you're uncomfortable and you don't know where you're going because that's like life. And that's what that was to me. But coming back, people weren't in you know, magazines, didn't want to hear it. And I kept spewing because I was writing that article in decline. And, and it was just one of those things. And it, it just took so much time to get people, Oh, you're just not good at downhill and you, you're not good at XCM. Well, well, you might be right, but I'm really good at both of them together. And this is, yeah, and it was the blend. And so it was, it was always a little bit of a battle, but it was, uh, it was one that I was willing to fight because I felt so passionate about how it makes you feel. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, did you see parallels between like the Downeyville Classic and some of the like Super D events to Enduro or, or was it like something just totally different in your mind? Well, you know, in the beginning, uh, Super D, well, Downeyville was, I think, a different animal. It's a practiced event. It's a long event. It's basically a point-to-point time trial. I wouldn't call it a full downhill. It's You have to have a big motor to win that race, you know. But in the very be- in the very beginning of Downeyville, it was way that before, you know, they got in the IMBA rules and some of that, you know, switchback bullshit, you know, like that makes you just have to pedal out of corners. It was a straight shot, and you had to have a proper bike. You're going mock chicken down some of this stuff, and they still have that. But they, you know, a lot of the stuff on butcher, the upper stuff, has been sanitized in a way that it turns into more of a physical battle. Mm-hmm. So I, I saw parallels, but I also saw it was a lot of practice. I spent a lot of time there. You know, I'm like, and I always said, I'm all, well, dude. I know it better than you. The only way, like Jurgen Benneke and I never really got along, and. uh that, you know, I had companies like SRAM and RockShox sending people to take me out there, you know, I mean, it was Miles Rockwell. I mean, you name the, the world champions that came to try and get me and I, I would just put them in the ground. I'm well, how are you going to do it? I have to actually mechanical for you to beat me because it's not possible. And I would say that, I mean, I wasn't that friendly to the, some people. Miles are just awesome. Jurgen, I, I would talk and be like at the top just going, there's no way you can beat me. And this is before the start, you know, just yeah. being a total, <laughs> but that's the, w- the way I had to be. I had a lot on the line. And when you did the FMF enduro back then, or those kind of enduro races, it was, it wasn't like that. Everyone was like, Hey, be careful, be safe, you know, on site. And it was more of a camaraderie instead of like, I want to tear your legs off. <laughs> I mean, did you enjoy that more or, or are you more the competitor? Sounds like you were starting some of it at Downeyville. Yeah, no, I like to start it. And I, and I, you know, if I, it was kind of like something that fed me a bit. Like if I, if I put my name on the line, I was willing to take the embarrassment or the victory. So I, I, I knew that there is, there is something, you know, going to happen. There is going to be a reaction and, and doing those magazine and those interviews and like, and vice clean, with muckster style writers that are, you know, mixing my words and stuff. You know, I didn't mind it because I'm like, you know what? I don't care. It's going to bring more people. It's going to be more attention and it's going to change how people see about biking. And we're going to get more trails out of it, more people, more trails, power and numbers. And that's kind of always been a large focus too for access. But it, when the Super D started, I, I Super D was kind of super dumb but like in the beginning it was actually pretty cool we did old world cup courses like at vermont and big bear like all the courses that felt too safe you know and eric carter wanted big jumps and stuff so they changed courses and they just kept these old tracks and we raced you know those on mass starts le mans starts which i don't agree with cyclists shouldn't run we look stupid (laughs) it's like but it was still, it was, you know, Jordy Lund, I mean, Johnny Waddell, you have all these guys doing these races and it was actually really fun. And then they, then they kept making it lamer and lamer just to make more money. In my opinion, with the super D name, you know, like it's sea otter. I mean, what a joke. That's, that's, that's just lame. You know, like I wouldn't race that. It's not fun. I, I don't want to do stuff. It isn't fun. So that it, so I did like the first two years of Super D, but after I kept going to Europe, I just I couldn't wrap my head around it anymore. I just felt like a waste of time. It didn't feel like I was doing it for me. I did it for other reasons, and that wasn't why I was riding bikes. Yeah, well, as a format, I mean, enduro definitely seems to be the most fun way that you can race your mountain bike. Totally agree. So when did you start to notice that like frame geometry and components were shifting sort of in that enduro direction here in the U S well, I mean, for me, I had a custom bike that was, I was, I was on Santa Cruz for a long time before Ross got got too big for his, his Italian slippers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he, they would make me custom bikes and I had 64 degree head angle back in 2000, probably four, maybe even sooner. What was that compared to like a downhill bike at that time? Uh, probably a little bit, maybe a little bit slacker because they were 66, but I was running low BBs and you know, that I had Fox suspension on there that was 
you know, well too, but shorter travels, you know, it's like 150 more in the 150 range, but the bike handled really well when you were at speed on steep terrain and you needed that, you needed it to be lazy on that stuff, especially when you don't know where you're going. So when Santa Cruz built me my, I polished, you know, nomad when they first came out, I'm like, we need it this slack. And, you know, Rob's like, we can't do that for the consumers. They're not ready for it. They need, they need steep angles. They're still high posters. They got want long stems cause they like, you know, steering a bus. And I'm like, dude, it's, it can't be this way. It, it works so much better like this. It was, it was one of those things that I rode, rode that bike for four years. And after that, I gave it to Marco Osborne, not even that long ago before he got on Cannondale and he, he won a bunch of races on that thing. It was, it was, it was a pretty geometry correct bike for that era. That was like pretty ahead of its time. People would get on it and be like the flat corners. It kind of pushes. I'm like, well, don't ride flat corners that are like not get a new bike or get a new style. You got to get over the front end. It was a whole new way of riding for us to be able to go down the steep stuff and have your chin over the hub front hub. You're like attacking, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it takes, it took a strong rider like you, uh, that, that could, you know, ride it uphill as well as downhill to prove that that, that was something that, people wanted and that people could handle, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's true. And I had a lot of guidance, you know, Nick is is my first, that first race over there in France. He sees me and he's on the chairlift and he, he sees me at the top of the hill. He's like, I don't really, I don't even know this. I know who he is, you know, freaking guys, my hero. And he's all chin up, chin up, Mark, <laughs> you're going fast enough. You will hurt yourself put your chin up, look ahead. And I'm like, Oh, and then Fabian Burrell, the same way, always really helped me with setup, you know, like at transfer bonds, Fabian's like, dude, we got to change something. You just beat me on this. Cause my setup would be like bars rolled forward. Cause this, the cockpit was too small, but I spent most of my time standing uphill. He's like, he's like, you can't have both. You can't, you're going to have one or the other. You can't be comfortable climbing because you're going to die going downhill with that way. So there is a lot of, uh, there's a huge learning curve from these people that just knew way more than me and had way more talent too. So I just had drive and, and they had, they had the, uh, vision to help me out. And I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's a nice segue into my next question. I mean, based on your experience over the years, which is more important in mountain biking? Is it, is it will or skills? I mean, obviously you need both, but what would you say is like a good split? Uh, for, for being successful in mountain biking? I mean, I think if all the really skilled people actually had will, there would be a, a ton of competition. But I think there's there's few few that are truly gifted and few that actually have the will to use it. I mean, I would take a bunch of will over skill because you can you can learn skill to a certain extent or just make your make your strong points extra strong and your weakness is just a time where you have to be patient. That's kind of what I was. I wasn't willing to gap the huge gaps or I was willing to go real fast on rough terrain downhill. Cause I'm really good at that kind of style, mm-hmm. just floating over rough at really high rates of speed. But you know, if it came to like, it, you had to do some weird technical jump over a rock or something like that, I would just have to be patient over that because that skill set is something that's born and, and not given. And there's a lot of practice, but you can't practice an awkward rock jump just anywhere. It just is something that's there, you know? So yeah, for me, I would, I would, I would be okay. Well, I'm going to bleed or hemorrhage a little time here, but I had a huge motor. I'm all, there's no way anyone's going to pedal out of this harder than me. So I used a big motor and the skills where I had it and, and the will for the skill I didn't have. <laughs> yeah. Well, how important are, is like fitness and that sort of thing for the transitions? I mean, would you say that makes a big difference between sort of the top competitors in enduro? Oh yeah. I mean that, that is like, if you can be fresh every time because you're so fit, I mean, that's what I I was doing back then. I was uh, transitions. I was riding eight hours a day, you know, I was like, (laughs) I didn't even, that's all I did. Like I spent most of my time riding my bike and just, I mean, I would do anywhere from five to eight K a day every day. Wow. I'd eat a lot of food and just sit there and 
and mix the pedals. And that was something that I knew that I could, I could accelerate and recover faster than anyone. I mean, that's how the hell ride was spawned, you know, just breaking people off, come and join us, you know, and that was, it was like an endurance of power and just being able to push that, that peak performance for long periods of time. And that's what enduro was so intoxicating to me. I'm like, this shit was made for me. You know, and and no one's doing it, dude. It's a small pond. I need to dominate now. It's not going to last. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Right place at the right time. I know. Crazy. So it sounds like in, in terms of your training as well, I mean, was recovery a big part of that? I mean, or did you did you just hammer, hammer, hammer? You know, like there is uh, during that million feet thing, that was the hardest thing ever. I got married. I raced 32 times. In 11 months, I did a million feet, and by the time it was over, I did 1,175,000. I, I was just pushing and pushing, and I got like uh, I got this weird cough in the middle of it because it was raining a lot, and I'd ride through these colds, and I ended up one time riding up this steep climb behind my house, and I was coughing so hard, like those wicked dry coughs that my jaw dislocated. Oh, geez. And I'm just stuck there with my mouth wide open. I don't know if you've ever seen or had that. I mean, I, I had a buddy do it in high school from the over yawn and cause he was real tired in science class and the science teacher came out and you know, you pull the jaw out and put it back in. And I had to do that to myself. And I was just like in the rain, like, cause you can't really breathe that well when your jaws disconnected and you're panicking. So I had a bunch of stuff going on and I never recovered. But then like Ferentino always told me, cause I was living with him during the Downeyville days. He's all in a year from now, you're going to be going so freaking fast. And he was right. That was 2008, uh, like beginning 2008 was my fastest, you know, I was, I was like in the lead group of like national crits on road biking. I was won every race I entered, but it took that long to rebound and like, you know, take recovery into perspective and, and diet and, you know, really get thin skin. You know, if I didn't have veins all the way across my belly, I was doing shit wrong. And, you know, I was eating well. I mean, it was, it was just, I was a very grumpy person back then. <laughs> well, for those who aren't familiar, I mean, you, you set a goal of climbing a million feet on your bike in a year. Why did you set that as a goal? I mean, was that just a training thing or was it, was it kind of its own competition with yourself? It, it was weird because I was doing this thing with motion base, which turned into Garmin and all that. Um, and it was like uh, basically just storing, GPSing all your rides. So I'm like, okay. And I got about two to three months in and this guy, Mike Maxim, who was like the guy that was sponsoring me on that. He's like, dude, I'm looking at your file here and – you're on, you could climb a million feet this year. If you just keep this up, I'm all really <laughs> You're like, is that good? Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't even know, you know, I, I, I just, I didn't know anything about it. I was, it was how I've been riding. You know, I've probably done over 800,000 feet numerous times in a year and I just don't track it anymore. But, and he's like, you could do it. So I'm like, okay. So he's all, here's two more garments. Cause people are going to call you out. Cause the 10% whatever, you know, cause the terrain mapping wasn't breadcrumbing like it is these days. Yeah. And, uh, I'm all, let's do this. And I started doing it and I got to about six, 700,000 feet of climbing. And I was like, man, I, it was hard to drag yourself out of bed, but I was like, now I, I set this and there's no way I can't do it now. You know, like I got, and then and everyone started talking about it. Failure was like, something that was the worst thing that could happen, you know, like l losing at anything you put your mind to and told people you were doing would have been an embarrassment to me. So I, that's why I went over so much farther, you know, and I think I only did, I did like over, I think close to 200,000 feet of it came from racing. And then uh, around 75 K came from road biking and the rest was all on this VP free, just an anchor. I still have the bike hanging on my ceiling. Wow. It was just one of those things on a 38 tooth ring with an 1132 cassette with, you know, a uh, seat always down and just standing at my house. I can, I can collect elevation like no other place I've ever been. It's like, it's so steep 
and the downhills are fast and then you just turn around and do it again. Yeah. Well, that may be the more amazing part to me that you did it all with your seat down. Yeah. Well, I did half the year and that's when Wayne found me because of all the press. And he's like, I have this gravity dropper and it was the pin pull one on the seat, but still it was like, you know, legendary fast compared to just your seat collar clamp. It was only a three inch drop, but back then that was enough, you know? Right. So that made a big difference, but I didn't, I still couldn't sit down and pedal because I my muscles were made different ways. Just big old butt from just like pedaling standing. Yeah. And seated pedaling just felt like just a yeah, you know, just numbing numbing the junk like nothing else. Right. Because the slack seat angles on those bikes were just crap. You know, this head angle was okay, mm-hmm. but slack seat angles and pedaling. I'm like, dude, why are these bikes like this? You guys and like like that bike I told you about had a steeper seat angle, slacker head tube. You know, it was, it was well in front of its head time. Yeah. Interesting. So last year, a lot of folks probably know this, you came close to suffering what's known as a widowmaker heart attack. And from what I read, part of your recovery following a surgery involved riding an e-bike, how's that helped you sort of get back into riding and fitness? Yeah, it's pretty uh, interesting, you know, like coming from a guy that everyone's like, you're so fit. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't matter, dude. If you store plaque, you store plaque. But I was accelerated use, you know, I was, you know, riding for 20 years at a level that burned a lot of calories. And at, at that time, I thought that I was more like an inferno or like uh, something that just burned yeah. everything that went in. It's not true. It still has to pass through the pipes. You, see, you know, you eat steak or bacon, you eat, you know, fatty, fatty foods mm-hmm. like that. It still has to run through the pri- pipes and it still can yeah. build up. So, I, you know, I didn't think this could happen. So, you know, when going into that, it, it lasted six weeks, you know, because I wasn't I, I'm like, yeah, it's from chopping wood because I was chopping a lot of wood mm-hmm. and getting stuff ready for the winter. So that that same soreness, that's what it feels like, center center of the chest, mm-hmm. shoulders, and in the uh, elbow bends. You get this weird pain every time I kind of start it up on my rides. And I'm like, ah, but then I push harder because I'm like, this doesn't feel right. So I'd go harder. When I went harder, because I have a bunch of collateral veins that go around the clot, it would, I'd feel good again because I'm using these other, other veins that are going around it. So I'm feeding everything I need, but at a, at a moderate pace, it hurt. Like it's the weirdest, most uncomfortable pain I ever had. But I, so I, every day I just go harder, I go harder. And then when I did the Tayabi crest trail with a bunch of friends for seven days, I was just like, man, I don't, I just don't feel good. We're like, you know, 10, 8,000 feet in that range. And we're out there. I mean, that's the loneliest highway in the world, at least in the country. And we're, and I'm like, ah. and it was, it, it was one of those things. I didn't think I, I could die from it, but I, I wasn't obviously thinking clear. I'm like, why am I still sore from three weeks ago? And when I came home, I tried to go for a ride and I'm like, you know what? This ain't right. And called my wife. I'm like, you know what? I need to go into the hospital. <laughs> and go get checked out. And when I went in there, they're like, Jesus, man, 99% blockage on the one that, that kills people. And I'm like, really? So into the cath lab instantly. They give me some new plumbing. They're like, if you didn't have all of these veins going around the clot, you'd be done. And I still got a couple blockages on the other side that are, you know, 20 or 30%, which they don't stint until they're 70. So I, I get that to look forward to. I've definitely changed my diet a bit. You know, I don't really eat red meat and bacon and cheese anymore. There's so many ways of thought. I I just get confused by it. (laughs) Right. Nobody seems to know exactly. Right. I mean, (laughs) right. And life, it it lasted till I was 46. So, you know, I, life's a crapshoot. I take it as it comes and I I don't want to just change my happiness to get like five more years. I'd rather be really happy right now. And deal with what I got and just, you know, try and try and be good to myself, but it's hard in the lifestyle that I'm in. Yeah. Well, I mean, is it, is part of it hereditary or is it, is it mostly diet in your case? No, definitely hereditary for me. My grandfather had a heart attack at 36, which is the guy who gives you, you know, my male pattern baldness. Also, he gave me some real, thanks grandpa. (laughs) Yeah. He was a badass man. 
and one of my best friends, he lived till he was 70. And, uh, you know, he, he said that to me, you know, you're probably going to have the same stuff I got. And, and I, I didn't believe any of it. I'm like, I'll exercise all that away. You can't, you can exercise the demons away, but you can't exercise your fate. You know, that's just kind of what you're born with. So you have to adjust, compensate. And, you know, they sit there and tell you the drugs fix most of it. You either got to trust them or, you know, just, I just go with the swing and just see what happens. And yeah, well, it's a really good message. I mean, I think a lot of us who are into mountain biking and, and fitness and eating healthy and doing all of those things kind of, maybe we think we're a little bit invincible and it's always good to, to remind ourselves that that's not the case and you can do all those right things, but you know, that's no guarantee. Yeah. I mean, just when you think you can like removing a tree that you've always done and all of a sudden it lands on you and you break your back, your sacrum and your pelvis and you're in a wheelchair and you're like, what the hell happened there, dude? I thought I had it handled. That's just a more brutal way to look at it because it, it comes at you in the form of a tree. But when it comes at you internally and you can't see it and all you can do is kind of feel it, but you don't know what's going on. It's very, it's a very scary time and you know uncomfortable for your family i don't like my kids seeing me do that my wife you know she's she's like one of my she's my best friend in the world so to put them through those kind of things makes you think twice about how you treat yourself because it's not about you at this point no more yeah yeah i mean for me personally that reading your story and hearing about it definitely makes me more conscious of you know how i'm feeling and and what my body's doing and and again yeah realizing that anything can happen to anybody and you got to you got to take care of yourself yeah i mean it's just having that uh, the same way of what enduro is it's on site it's chin up you got to look through life like you ride a bike you know i mean a lot of a lot of stuff that i've learned came from hard work because of dirt and berms building pump tracks and building community you know, I was just telling my kid, I had all him and his buddies over to reopen my pump track in the backyard. I'm all, you got to know what this dirt represents. It represents freedom. It represents a choice and it represents hard work. That's going to go into, you might not be a professional biker or get paid to ride bikes, but this is going to teach you how to work, like work ethic, like sweat, build a callus, do something, you know, make yourself feel pain to get something out of it, to share it with the community. The stronger your community is, the stronger you are. And that's like a lot of the focus I've had in my life. Yeah. Well, yeah, I do want to hear too about how you've been using the e-bike. Are you still riding e-bikes uh, in terms of your recovery or how does that fit in? It's crazy. I, I love I love my e-bike. I mean, I got into mountain biking when I was a little kid or like riding, let's just say riding bikes. First time I did it, it was for freedom, right? You get on a bike, you're like, holy shit, I got wheels. And, and all of a sudden you're rolling around. I can get away from mom. I, get, I can make space. Like there's, there's nobody's business. And then I got in it, you know, for fun and then freedom. Freedom, then fun. It was like just fun. I just did it for fun. But then when I got it in my 20s, I got it into it for suffering like I was a hunter. I'd, I had to hunt for suffering. I had to be macho. You know, I basically needed to bring home the beef, you know, and that lasted a long time, you know, and after the, I was still doing it up until the, the widow maker hit. So then when I see my doctor about it after the fact and everything, I tell him what I'm doing. He's like, what in the hell are you doing? Like, you can't, that, that's not what you can do anymore. Not, no man should do that after 40, like that amount of suffering. It's not good for you. Interesting. It's like you're taxing the stuff that I showed him all of my, you know, basically my heart rate, my watts, like my sleep rate, like all these things you can put together mm -hmm. on this one training program. And he's like, look at that, dude. He's like, you are not even recovered. You're taxing your ass a lot. Mm -hmm. That's just wearing you out early, basically. I mean, that's why all these triathletes die early. I mean, you're just, you're revving your motor for a long time. And hmm. then I show my e-bike, I, I can control my rate of exercise, my breath, mm -hmm. my heart rate. And I have so much more damn fun. Like I'm not into suffering anymore. I'm kind of over it. I, I, I like... I like the feeling of exercise. I like, I mean, that's why people don't like there is such a small population truly gets into this kind of mountain biking 
is because it hurts. And people, a lot of people just don't want to suffer. The e-bike takes that all away. You can suffer if you want, but you don't have to. So you can control so much more and it's all about control these days and, you know, compressing the file. All of a sudden you take a, a three hour ride that takes an hour and a half, but you still got that mental stimulation from what you needed, which for me, it's downhill. For me, it's like hitting trail and being outdoors, chin up, looking around and seeing my surroundings on a regular bike. I'd be staring at my fork tubes cause I'm still suffering cause <laughs> it's so steep. So I, I love my e-bike. I, I do two battery rides almost every day. I do almost eight to 10 K 10 K half days. And that's what I do every day. And it's like, I, I, I still don't, I mean, people will argue with me because they're still macho and they don't understand it. I think quite yet, or they've never done it. I, I still don't know if I ever need a regular bike. I mean, the way it's going, I'm having so much damn fun on these new e-bikes that it's just one of those things. I'm like, I want to, I, I don't live forever, man. I, I don't need to prove anything to you guys. Yeah. I really want to have fun and I want to ride with the people that I missed for freaking 15 years yeah. that stopped riding. Now they're all with me back hmm. and I have a bigger riding group. We're all on e-bikes and, you know, and all of them are, are not even mountain bikers. They, they were a long time ago, but they're guys that just weren't mountain bikers and now they're in the game. And that's going to create access. That's going to create power and numbers. And, you know, just like Tahoe National Forest, we've worked on for two years with Bosch and People for Bikes and WTV and Sierra Buttes Trail Stewardship. We've worked on access at the national level through the National Forest. And they just made Schedule 1 e-bikes legal in the National Forest, which is a huge thing. Oh, wow. And that's – people don't get it. These people are getting so, like – you shouldn't be there because you don't deserve it kind of thing, which I don't like people judging people. I don't think that's fair. You don't know their life. Right. You're not them. And just because you're fit does not make you better, you know? And if you wanted to be at the top of that mountain by yourself, that ship may have sailed. You might have to get the hell out of California, okay? <laughs> because there's a lot of people here and we can change the way people look at exercise, create safer routes to school and stuff like that, like WTV does because of this e-bike and power numbers and people go, why can't I ride there? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know anything about this mountain bike problem. And it, it, when you have that many, the, the, the amount of people that are going to come into the e-bike world that aren't mountain bikers is going to be something that will blow land managers away because they won't mm. know how to control it. Look how Marin does it. Marin County is so lame. They're so liberal, right? They think they know everything. Mm -hmm. They don't let you do anything. It's a police state. So they just say, no, e mountain bikes are illegal everywhere. You see how that's worked out for them? <laughs> right. They have so many social trails. It's a complete dysfunctional machine. One of the worst things I've ever seen and how they control it. All they do, they're supposed to make actual solutions. All they do is create more problems between user groups and fighting. It's like, mm, it's yeah. ridiculous. And, and you're like, you guys have to create solutions. People have to share their toys. If they don't share their toys, people go make new toys. And, <laughs> right. and that's the way it's worked here. And I'm like, you get people like on the East coast, like we want no e-bikes. We have access issues. I'm all, dude, you guys don't get it. If you say no, it doesn't work. Right. Because there's going to be people that come in and are not going to listen to you. And you want to get in a fist fight over it, you're going to lose it, dude, because it doesn't make sense for you to fight something that's going to come in such a wave that is unstoppable. Mm -hmm. You have to control it by rules and giving people what they need so they don't take what you don't give them. And, and that's, the, that's the problem that people I don't think can see yet. We have ridden illegally my whole life. That's all I do over here. That's all everyone does. That's the way it is. Yeah. So we're totally, I, I go somewhere else. They're like, you can't ride there. I'm all says who it's not a moral issue. <laughs> you can go f yourself, dude. I'm going to ride there because it, it doesn't make sense to me that you can tell me I can't. And this horse can, and you know, this, this freaking big ranger truck can this quad and this motorcycle with the sheriff on it can, that doesn't make sense to me. If you're going to create an access that excludes a huge user group, you're going to have a problem. And I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it because I've grown up in Marin. If anyone actually came here and saw what it's like, they would understand that it doesn't work. So no doesn't work. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of ironic in the sense that 
you know, mountain bikers see hikers as being unfair towards us and, and telling us we can't ride. And yet we turn around and tell, you know, people who are ride bikes that are a little bit different than ours that they can't ride. So it's kind of feels a little hypocritical in a lot of cases. It totally does. And those people that say no, A, I haven't ridden one, A, mo- or B, they, they, they like to debate on a platform that they have no intelligence on because they're not going to listen like a liberal or something like that. They're like, I, I, that's your ideals. I can't listen to it. There's no way. And you're like, dude, you don't get it. And you need to put your leg over it and see that you're, you can take your dad to the top of a mountain. Yeah. So maybe some kids are going to ride it. Like, but some kids don't want to suffer these days. The, the new generation of kids, like my son's age, you're 10, they're a bunch of sissies. I mean, they bunch of, I, I tell them all the time, well, dude, you guys would get your ass kicked in my era, like right now. Right. Because and that's what people are worried about. They're like, oh, this is not fair. Or I, I don't know what it is, but yeah, people, people see that. It's a bunch of scorekeeping idiots that just spend their time like involved in just this version of like what they think it should be. And it doesn't work that way anymore, dude. There's too many cooks in, in the, and chefs in the kitchen that all want different things. And if you can't come to some kind of common ground, you're, you're never going to get along. And when bikers hate other bikers, that doesn't make any sense. Two wheels are friends. I'm not saying we should be friends with motorcycles or anything like that. I don't like, yeah, well, I don't like that e-bikes are getting built by motocross companies, you know, or motorcycle companies. I don't, I don't think we should be in alignment with that. That's not what these are. These are schedule one e-bikes that don't, it's a, you know, 350 watt system, 250 watt system that just, you know, gives you some support for the people that need it to get out there. And I think the biggest problem with the cyclists that fight against it are the ones that feel that people don't deserve to be at the top. They don't deserve to be there. They didn't do it on their own. And at one point I was that guy. I'm not like that anymore. I see the difference. I felt the difference. I am what created my own difference and having my dad and, you know, going to go ride with my wife and kid and do an e-bike ride. We enjoy nature. I don't mind stopping for other user groups ever on an uphill downhill i've got a little bit of support so i'm always like okay to stop stop at a stop sign let a car go by on a regular bike you're not so acceptive of that kind of stuff you're like you're kind of in my way now i'm kind of pissed off now my tones kind of change for the next half an hour i'm thinking about how i'm gonna freaking jump you in the woods because you pissed me off you know i mean there's a lot of things that create animosity but on an e-bike i'm like the friendliest guy i ever met uh yeah you bring up an interesting point too about uh sort of the mental health side of it. I mean, a lot of people ride mountain bikes for an escape, right? A mental health, like it just makes them feel good. I mean, do you feel the same riding an e-bike as you would a regular bike? I mean, it sounds like you're almost saying you feel even better after an e-bike ride than you would on a traditional bike. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, I probably wouldn't feel as good because – I needed a different thing back then. You know, I needed, I needed that, that feeling of like burying myself in a hole. But now, I, now I don't cause I got, I got a family. I got to get my kid from school. I got to, uh, you know, take care of stuff around the house. Now the e-bike I get done. I am so stoked. I can't wait to ride tomorrow. And I do rides that I could never do back to back. I do. I mean, eight K a day. AK a day. I just, I was, I did, you know, I, 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 for, I forgot how much I was doing some testing with SRAM and it's like, they're like, your rides are insane and you do them for, you know, it's like so much ground you cover, which is also a concern. If everyone does that, is that going to be people pollution? It probably will, but will that create more access? Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but we better figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we'll need more trails. We need more trails. And then be like, oh, you're going to destroy the trail. Dude, that's bullshit, dude. E-bikes have more traction than any regular bike. You do less skidding. Like the, the rear brake potential because the motor's down low is so much more solid. You slow down quicker in, in a lot of situations. Not in every situation. In super steep stuff. You know, you do got the weight. But like in a lot of situations, it has more available traction because of its weight. And the other thing is that's what we're here for to steward the land. If we're going to use it, that's why we have like Sierra Buttes trail stewardship. That's what they do. They steward the land. They constantly go out, check it 
and then do work to it. That's what we do as a community. That's what builds community. You don't just ride bikes. You also help keep the trails alive. You keep out there and build a community around, you know, big lunches and, and doing trail work and it's fun and it's, and it, and it creates a stronger army. So people are thinking that it's all going to get thrashed because you added all these user groups, but then you add more stewards of the land and that's what you want. You want people to respect the land and then go and work on it if it gets beat up. But that's what it's there for. Cause if you don't take care of that tread, it'll turn into, you know, get trail. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and then other people will start making it wider. That's why you, that's why all these organizations exist. You know, like you don't see the horse groups or the hiker groups going out there, the PCT, give me a break. Those guys wouldn't cut a tree down to save their life, <laughs> but they go around it, you know, and then leave toilet paper and shit at the top of the ridge. You're like, bikers don't do that. We're very, even e-bikers, even though people probably think differently, we don't leave trash. It, you got to take a dump. You bury your crap off the trail. I mean, there's like a lot of stuff. And you can haul your chainsaw easier. Yeah, I know. We do a ton of trail work because of the e-bike. And that's, I have a 14 inch still and I, I carry that thing and do trail work because I, I like doing trail work. And now I have an easier way to do it. And there's just so many benefits to what an e-bike can bring to a lot of people in, in training if you're a racer because you don't have to ride on the road anymore. Road biking is awesome as long as there's no Priuses around. And for me, as soon as I got the e-bike, I was done with road road biking because I can do the same spin uphill and then get a downhill. So well, what's the point of being on the road with a bunch of cars that have no respect for me? You know, I don't like trusting some people, you know, I mean, all those people in the Prius do their best multitasking. Like I'm not going to leave it up to them to not hit me. You know, that's not, <laughs> I don't want them to have an extra job, which is me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, mountain biking has taken you all over the world over the years. So what are some of the best trails or places that you've ridden that really stand out in your mind? Uh, I mean, if, if I had to do every trans Provence with Ash and that gang, it has been some of my best trips. I did three trans Provences. I had some of the best times of my life on those, you know, when the first time it was a seven day turned into a six day cause we were all real tired. And, and it, those were some of the best times of my life. But there's also, you know, the, when we did all of the tribe sports, the urge, urge Kenya, there's urge Nepal and then urge uh, Cabo Verde. Those were adventures. They were slightly uncomfortable because of uh, such a third world way of life that I wasn't really accustomed to, like going through Nairobi and stuff like that. It was it was very eye opening to see how damn lucky we are and what we complain about is not really that important and how tough and badass these people were. So those trips through like Urge Cabo Verde was very eye opening. Four islands, boat rides. A, a culture that was so respectful, but probably my favorite one is my Dolomite trip, 10 days in the Dolomites for this e-bike shoot for Cannondale. I covered so much ground on an e-bike that I would have never got to see. And it's legal there. So we got to do, I, I rode the whole place. Like I, I don't, I, we, we did so much terrain with my buddy Ollie and then the Cannondale folks, marketing guys over there. And it was, it was like, are you kidding me? On a regular bike, I would have seen a, a, a tenth of it. You know what I mean? It would have been, we got to do so much. It was the best film shoot I've ever done, you know? And of course, we did the whole film, and then Cannondale was scared to show it to the US market because, you know, because e bikes were so volatile and they didn't want to take away my image. I totally get it. Yeah. But it was a great video that they only showed in Europe about, you know, what, what you can do and adventure on. But that, and then my favorite one also has still been the Toyabi Crest Trail. That, I mean, if you've never been out west off the Highway 50 to like Ely, Nevada, it is hot springs and just complete vastness like you've never seen. It's it's crazy. So, I mean, blessed that I've been able to do all these things and, you know, that Fred Glow actually had, you know, gave me the option and start that with him, like with that first FMF Enduro series turned into all of those adventures in Europe. He pretty much, I owe a lot to, he, he, he gave me the uh, ability to do these traveling and have sponsorship because it created so much, 
you know, created a lot for me. I appreciate him. Yeah, that's really cool. So you've worked closely with WTB for, by my count, at least a couple of decades now. So what are some of the projects that you're most proud to have been a part of? I mean, it, there, there's a whole bunch of them. The werewolf was kind of weird. You know, I don't really like my <laughs> name anywhere. You know, like it, it was a good tire, you know, at, in its time. Um, Mark Slate is like one of my best friends, him and Seidler who own the company. They're great people. Um, we've had our, we've had our differences at times, but it's, when you're like brothers, that's the way it works. Mm-hmm. And we always work it out cause we love each other. But, you know, working with Jason Moshler, when he came in, that was probably our best tire, like really tire engineering stuff. And that's mm-hmm. what the tires that are out now, basically because of Jason Moshler, and all the testing and testing that we've been doing, and we're still doing it, you know, like some of our tires are wearing out a little too quick. We went a little too soft. We're constantly adjusting that stuff. And I, I think we're in on the right path. I think it's hard because people look at our name sometimes and there's just animosity, but I always go, what are you actually supporting? You know, we're a bunch of, you know, maybe you don't like Americans. I don't know, but we all live here. Mm-hmm. We all have a huge passion. We all ride bikes. And then you support a brand like Maxis. Maybe they have some U.S. office, but you're actually supporting an Asian brand that probably doesn't really ride that much. You know, I mean, maybe I'm saying too much. I don't really care. But like we're we're a passionate brand that actually has your best interest. And if you actually talk to us, you'll understand that we really want to be a part of something. Yeah, we're we don't have our own manufacturer. We've been suffering doing that kind of tire making, but we're, we're, we're starting to make headway, starting to have better relationships and producing better rubber, better casings, casing technologies, wheel systems with our rims. Um, so, I mean, it's been, it's been a long haul and there's a, at at one point we had some shit product. I ain't going to lie. It was terrible. The Prowler line. What a joke, dude. I mean, I felt like we were fooling our customer and we all felt that we scrapped all those molds. We basically said, we're not going to We're not going to sell any of this stuff. And now we have this gravel line that really kicks ass. We're really proud of. And that's the thing that we came together with when Jason came. We have to be proud of the product. Totally proud within all of us that it actually works and does what it is supposed to do. And and, and now we're at that point. We're like we're getting there, but it's taken so many testers. We have so many testers that are friends and colleagues all over the world that are really helping us do this because we can't do it on our own. You know, you can't just sit there. We don't have the ability to just sit there and, Oh, that mold doesn't work and scrap it. We, we have to consider how much it costs and time and everything to do it. We don't have a big crew, you know, we don't have a lot of engineers and we have two, you know what I mean? So when we're, when we're doing this stuff, it's like important to us to get it right. And we don't always get it right. And we've made mistakes, but we're, we're trying to be on point now and, and give the consumer something they can be proud to buy and be part of. It's not just a product. It's you're buying into what, what we do over here is a lifestyle. And what we really respect is, you know, the people who buy our product, they're part of us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a really cool brand. And, and yeah, like you said, there's been a lot of, a lot of innovations over the years. I mean, the, the work with TCS system, uh, early on with tubeless. And obviously that's a big thing. Now everybody is running tubeless and that technology has kind of progressed as well. Where do you see opportunities for mountain bike product improvement in the future? I mean, the biggest opportunity, I mean, if you look at like people probably don't want to hear this from me, but like the e-bike market in the U S is, basically 8% of the size of Europe. We're growing 50 to 56% a year, and they don't see that having a decline in any time soon, at least not in the five to 10 year forecast. You have the, the actual mountain bike or cycling is fairly flat, maybe at a one, 2% growth. And when you sit there and look at that e-bikes are coming in, what's going to wear out brake pads, tires, seat posts. This is all the things I've worn out on my e-bike. Seat posts do weird things. Cables do weird things like uh, adjustable seats. They, they snap cables now. Your suspension gets worked because everyone that's buying e-bikes are actually going to ride now. Think of the percentage of people that buy really nice bikes and don't ride. It turns into a hat hanger, a shelf. E-bikes are actually going to get ridden. So consumable parts are going to be the – they already are kind of what is, you know, people make their bread and butter on. It's going to go – 
tenfold. Look at Germany's brake pad sales. You're going through brake pads like they're going out of style, you know, like it's, it's like everything is going to wear out faster. And cause people are actually riding, you know, because the e-bike gives you that support. So our products for regular mountain bikes are going to get better, you know, like yeah. drive trains are going to get better. You know, it's like they, they, there's already some innovations with SRAM and stuff that, you know, the drivetrain parts last way longer. You're like, whoa, where was this? You know, like this is this is actually really cool. You know, brakes have to become stronger, cool, better. Like so there's there's a lot of innovation that has to come because of weight and because of actually sheer use. And I think that's what, you know, as an industry, we can actually find growth and not just by bike sales, but by consumable parts all the way up to like, you know, a Thule pack that has a stabilizing battery mount inside it, you know, so you do those two battery rides, mm. um, you know, a lot of different things like that, you know, how am I going to carry this? So oh, now I got this battery, what other parts do I need? You know, like what's breaking, what's wearing out. So I think that's something that people, I don't think is taken in full, especially in the U S maybe some of the manufacturers, but everyone's, there's still some resistance thinking that it's not going to hit like the way it's going to hit. I don't believe so. I mean, you look at Europe, you look who's riding bikes and you know, I don't want to sell to a bunch of people on pink bike. I don't really care what you guys think because you guys are all know it all. I want to sell to new people. I want to sell to non endemic people that actually have nothing to do with mountain biking. I want to bring them into the fold and create power. And that's what we've been doing with, you know, we have a program out of the local sports basement bike shop here that gives a deal to all of the MCMA motorcycle club that I have. And all these e-bikes that have been going out of there are people that want to like, don't even ride their motorcycle anymore. Cause they're like, this is way easier. This is way healthier for me. I just lost 20 pounds. I'm like, dude, you're healthier for it. Our medical system will be better because of it. I mean, these are small things and people probably think that that's too much, you know, looking into the future. But if you consider that people could exercise more, should we not give them the chance just as a community and as actual, you know, how, how we spend our money? You're like, God, medical reasons are a huge thing, dude. It's because people are fat and lazy. A little bit of support can help. Right. Yeah. As mountain bikers, we tend to focus on or sort of imagine ourselves, you know, we're very fit. We're very active. Imagine ourselves being less fit and less active because of e-bikes. But, but there are so many more people who don't ride bikes at all. And, and what about them? I mean, it's, it's clearly a benefit. So that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you're right. It's not about us. It's, a, it's about, you know, them and them are us, you know? So it's like, it's like, you can't, you know, sit there and, and people want it. That I get confused when people want to sell to people that already know everything. I'm like, dude, I can't, I can't sell you everything. Cause you just want to debate about how you think it's, I'd rather just go to a different crowd and, and, and I want to go to the, the bird watching group. We have all these old timers. I want to, we're, we're trying to figure out a demo ride with these old timer blue hairs I show up with these e-bikes on this flat terrain that usually takes them, you know, an hour to walk out to. I want to put these guys on bikes and be like, here, I'll, let's go. Let me show you what this actually is. And it'll be eye-opening and I guarantee we'll win. And, and that's the kind of stuff that'll create access because you get our haters to freaking be your, your biggest advocate. You're winning. You know, it's like going to the moms. How do you get access? Go to the moms. How do you get a safer route to the school? Let's talk to the mothers, you know, because they have the passion and the understanding and people like hardcore cyclists like I was, we are so one sided and that is just not fair to everyone. Well, Mark, clearly you're a really passionate advocate for mountain biking and have done so many awesome things over the years. Uh, so thank you for joining us and, and for sharing the stoke for mountain biking. Hey, well, thank you. And, uh, Hopefully I didn't piss too many people off, but I'd gladly debate them later. <laughs> right. We'll see. We'll read the comments carefully. <laughs> I will not. I do not read comments. So you can let me know how it goes. <laughs> right. Yes. I say that with a wink. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I appreciate you thinking of me. I'm stoked to have this happen. Absolutely. Well, if you're enjoying the Single Tracks podcast, we'd love to have you rate us and subscribe to us. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. 
Peace.